In this in-depth video, I'll take you through the entire process of building a custom Chinese Carbon AliExpress inspired gravel bike. From triumphs. How they feel as well, we've just done a quick test ride on it. To mistakes. It wasn't the worst, but it's not easy. I'm lucky enough to be joined by Johnny again, who's been a bike mechanic for 18 years, and he shares some seriously valuable tips in this video throughout the whole build. You'll get to see every bolt being installed with context and explanations, the total cost of all the parts and the entire build and of course there is no build video without a weigh-in at the end. I reckon it's a light middleweight. Interestingly in my poll 35% of you think that carbon is the best material for a gravel bike. Let's see what you think at the end of this video. The first point of call is setting up the rims. We are going tubeless for this build which is my first tubeless bike. Welcome to the 21st century Jordan. Nice of you to get out from under that rock. It won't change the past. When doing a full build like this we are starting with the wheel set up so we can make sure that they are holding pressure later in the day. If your rims are used and dirty, then you need to make sure you clean them with an IPA cleaner to ensure that the tubeless take sticks correctly. If like mine, the wheels are new, then you can hit the ground running, or should I say rolling. Now I have this 26 millimeter wide prime tubeless tape that costs eight pounds. Now the tape you use should be relative to your inner width. Now these wheels have an inner width of 21 slash 22 mil when I measured at the lip, but the wheels have a recess under that lip where the bead of the tire sits. So I opted for the 26 millimeter as these wheels are relatively wide. Now when installing the tape, you need to make sure that it's pulled nice and tight and is installed straight. You don't want any kinks or wrinkles in the tape. Now Johnny also starts opposite to the valve so there is no join in the tape or it doesn't finish close to the valve. He makes it look pretty simple to be honest, what a legend. In terms of wrapping, depending on the pressure you're running, mountain bike is fine to go around once depending on the thickness of the tape but because we're probably running gravel maybe a slightly higher pressure they'll probably go around twice. So going around the tyre twice gives you a much better chance of sealing and ensures there are no gaps. I'm on board. The 10 meter roll of bar tape could probably do one more wheel that is double wrapped. So for reference, one pack will certainly do one bike. Let's add the eight pound for the tubeless rim tape to the cost tracker, which we will update as we go through the video. Once the tape is installed, use a plastic tire lever to push any tape into the little recess around the wheel to make sure it's all nice and flat. Next up, we need to set up the valve. There are a few fiddly components to this, so let me explain. We have the cap, also known as the dust cap. We have the valve core, which screws into the valve stem and often comes pre-installed. We have the lock nut and beneath the top nut, an o-ring which helps create a seal. We then have different variations of a rubber base that is installed on the inside of the rim. There is also a valve core tool to remove and install the valve core in the stem. So it's a simple and foolproof setup. No, it's not. With the rim tape installed, we need to puncture a hole to allow the valve to pass through. Firstly, Johnny marked the inside with a small Allen key, creating a little indent that you can see from the other side. The valve is pressed through the tape and reveals itself like a glorious stars in your eyes moment. The O-ring is then put into the stem, followed by the lock nut. As the lock nut is tightened, the O-ring is compressed as well as the rubber base, creating a seal around the valve hole. Be sure to tighten it fairly tight so no air can escape and leave you and your tire deflated. Now for the tires, I'm using these Panaracer Gravel King 43 mil wide tires. A set of these will cost you around 60 pounds. Now I had these laying around, as you do, so they are already used, which makes them looser which affects the tubeless setup as you will see in a minute. We checked for a directional arrow on the tire, but they are asymmetrical, so they can be installed either way. The wheels I'm using are the Pro X 33mm Gravel CX wheel set. I have a full video review on these and these wheels cost around £315. Not bad for a full carbon wheel set. Then it's time to test your grip strength and get the tire over the rim. Get one side on, hopefully by hand. These tires slid on nicely because they're used. Careful if you do use a tire lever as you can damage the rims quite easily. Now on the second side, get 75% of the tire on, leaving enough space to pour in some tubeless sealant. The tubeless sealant we are using is Stan's tubeless sealant. Johnny recommended it. I jumped on the Forbidden Juice bandwagon and bought a bottle. A sip here, a sip there. 100 millimeters of the Forbidden Juice was poured into the tire. There is a measure on the side of the bottle, so use that. 
Now for the fun part, grab the tire and rotate the bit left to be installed so it's at the top of the wheel. Then use all your might to install the final part of the tire onto the wheel. These were pretty easy to install, which is good at this moment in time. Excess sealant was swiftly removed and the tire is ready to be pumped into a large donut. The sealant is 20 pound a bottle and we used about a third. So let's add seven pound to the cost tracker. It all adds up. Holy bank balance. I bought this 50 pound Beto charge pump, which basically helps give a burst of air rather than a slow gradual pump. We need a burst of air to help create a seal quickly, which is needed for the tubular setup, especially when the tires are loose as these are. To charge the pump, you need to use a normal track pump to pump it up. You can pick one up for around 30 pound. We added 120 PSI to the tank to give us plenty to play with. Yes, yeah, so I'm just taking the valve core out because it makes it easier for the air to go in. So less resistance means more chance it will see. On goes the charge pump and air is released into the tire. Because the valve core is out, the next steps are super important. Gotta be fast. Oh, I see. <laughs> I think we can all agree, Johnny made that look super simple. What a legend. We then pump the tire up to its max PSI, which is 60 for these tires to help everything seat correctly. The tire is then bounced around to ensure the sealing is forced in every crevice. It's spun as well to really get the sealant spread over every inch of the tire. If it's hissing at you like a wild anaconda, give it a minute and hopefully it should seal. If it doesn't, I'm sorry I gave you false hope. How could you do that? <laughs> then we repeat the process with the front wheel. So on goes the valve and then the tire is installed, leaving 25% open on one side. Pour in the forbidden juice and use your inner strength to install the final quarter of the tire. Remove the valve core, pump up the tank, release air into the wheel, reinstall the valve core, inflate to 60 PSI, give it a good spin and a shake and spread all that sealant around. <laughs> We will check them later to ensure they have held their pressure, so stay tuned to see if it worked. Before we do anything else, we need to get the seat post installed in the frame so that we can clamp the bike into the bike stand. We clamp the seat post and not the tubes on the carbon frame. Don't be naughty now. We have this little rubber piece that goes on the seat post first, which prevents water getting in when you are riding through a blizzard. We went to put the seat post in and it was pretty tight with the clamp very loose, tighter than we would have liked. However, with some tinkering and fiddling with the seat post clamp, Johnny figured out that the clamp needs to be in the perfect position or perfect angle to get the seat post in. We chuck the seat onto the seat post as that allows us to get more leverage. This is done with two little bolts on the seat post clamp. The seat that I'm using for this build is a Sella Italia Flight Flow, which costs £35. It was a random choice, but it seemed like good value and had decent reviews. It also has the uh, anatomical cutout for extra comfort and airflow around the uh, that region. With some more dancing and twisting and wiggling, the seat post slid in and we tightened the bolt up to five newton meters with our torque wrench. You can pick a torque wrench up like this with hex bits for around 35 pounds. Yeah, so the wedge was a bit funny, I don't know, just fiddling around with it to get it as loose as it can be. Um, just gotta like fiddle around with the nut and the bolt. Next on the list is the fork installation. We need to cut the fork steerer down so that it's the right height for me and my body geometry. We get all the parts laid out so we know what we are working with. Everything here is from AliExpress or direct from the manufacturer in Asia. How experimental of me. When doing the test install, you want everything in the frame. So you want the headset bearings and then all the washers required. Then you can have a play with the spacers and see what height you like. In the box, we have various spacers, which is great to see. And after playing with different combinations, I went for the 20 mil and the five mil spacer. As this is a gravel bike, I'm happy for it to be a bit more relaxed and less of a slammed stem. The 20 mil spacer is actually used to help root the cables into the head tube of the frame, which is blooming marvelous. The stem can then be placed on top like icing on a scrumptious cake and tightened on. Make sure there isn't any play at this stage because you're about to mark the fork steerer for cutting and you don't want it to be too short. Measure twice, cut once. To mark the fork steerer, use something you have to hand. We are using a little file to give us a clear indicator. You can then remove the stem, washers and the spacers. Grab the compression plug that you have that comes with your headset and see how big the lip is 
on the compression plug. You can then put the lip against the fork steerer where you made your mark and make a second mark at the bottom of the lip on the compression plug. From past experience, this is normally around three to four millimeters. Insulation tape is then added around the mark that is going to be cut to help prevent any fraying. Time to whip out the cutting tools like a DIY ninja. Now I've got this cable cutting guide from Wiggle that set me back a cool 30 pounds, a hacksaw from Screwfix and a 32 TPI teeth per inch cutting blade which combined was another 20 pounds the cost of tools can quickly add up we are ready to give the fork steerer the chop so i installed the clamp outside so we don't make a mess inside the cable cutting guide goes into the clamp and the fork goes into the cable cutting guide it's like they're all made for each other in some kind of diy rom-com give everything a spray to suppress the dust the forks and the blade that is then slowly cut through the steerer no rush be delicate. This is the second time we have seen Johnny's majestic cutting action on this channel. I do treat you guys well. Another spray mid cut and the final section is chopped through. Remove the tape then wet sand the edge of the tube down so there are no shards or sharp edges and she is ready to be installed in the frame. Progress. The washers and spacers are added followed by the bars and we are looking good my friends i actually really like the look of these bars and cannot wait for the finished result at the end of this video this is now all removed again so we can route the cables through the frame the yo-yo of bike building in out in out the cables that i am using on this build and every other build are jaguar we have the pro shift kit as well as the pro brake cable kit 31 for the brake cable and 17 pounds for the gear cables. From experience, these perform well and last a long time. I have a one by setup on this bike, which means I only have one chain ring at the front of the bike instead of two. This means that we don't need a front gear cable running to a front derailleur as it doesn't exist. This also means one less cable to route through the frame and bars and give us more space. You'll see how that works out shortly. The cables are all installed from the back of the bike to the front as it's easier to pop them out of the head tube than the small holes at the rear of the frame. The rear gear cable went in and it was a little bit hard to route due to the asymmetrical frame shape and the right dropout having a tighter angle. But a bit of fiddling in the bottom bracket, as you do, and it was routed up the down tube and popped out at the head tube. For the rear brake cable, we removed the little plastic insert in the frame pushed the cable through and it went in without a fight and rooted nicely, again popping out at the head tube. The brake cable just comes as one long cable so you have to measure how much we need against the caliper and then give it the chop. To give it the chop I have specific cutters that cost around £10. Show me the money. <laughs> We can then route the remaining brake cable through the front fork. The cable didn't want to go upwards, so we retried from the top down and that worked without any issue. Johnny mentioned the hole for the cable on the fork and the fact that it is on the side of the steerer. Yes, I know it's on some of these sort of um, forks. The routing always comes out of the left, which probably is fine if you're having a left hand front brake. But if it's in the middle, at least you can do both anyway. So front, you know, either left or right. As we are using an integrated bar and stem combo with cables routed through them, we need to consider where the cables will come up past the fork and into the bars. We have the rear brake on the left lever and we have the rear gear and front brake on the right lever. So you want the cables to follow that logic. I can't stress how important this is. The cables can't cross over around the head tube as there just isn't any space. With all that figured out, on went the forks, on went the bearing cap, then the main bearing cover, followed by the five mil spacer and then the 20 mil spacer. Johnny pointed out that the spacers are plastic, which is a good thing. Yeah, so these um, spacers are much better purely because they're plastic. Less chance of damaging the steerer, easier to fit on, especially when it splits, as you can see there. So you can put on or take out without doing too much, or even do it once the bike's even built up anyway as well. All is looking good, our very own Johnny, the uh, mechanical marvel, rose to the challenge. Now for challenge number two, and probably the hardest, routing the cables through the bars. I'm ready. As mentioned earlier, we have three cables to route, and considering the space we have, I'm pleased there are only three and not four. With the front brake in hand, Johnny attempted to slide the cable through without the cable guide. No luck this time though, so out came the RISC cable routing tool, which cost £13. The routing tool is then fed through the bars. One end has a magnet and the other 
will attach to the brake housing. So make sure you have it the correct orientation. You can use the magnetic end to guide the other end through the bars. The routing tool is then screwed into the gear housing. Even though there are no official threads, it's kind of like screwed and pushed in at the same time. Now we have the routing tool through the bars and attached to the brake housing, so it's time to feed it through the bars. Pushing and pulling is a key here. Give yourself the best chance. Too much pulling and the adapter will come out of the cable housing and you are back to square one. With some to me to you action, the cable popped its head out of the bars, the excess can be pulled through, one cable complete. The rear gear needed the routing tool as well. This was a little harder to thread through the bars because the brake cable we just routed has metal in it, so the magnet that we're using likes to attach itself to that. The bars have these rubber lugs which can be removed. This gives people another option for cable routing. We are actually going to use them as viewing holes so we can see what's going on in there. We can then get the two ends to meet where the viewing hole is to ensure the magnet is connected to the other end of the routing tool. Again, the tool is screwed into the housing and we can start feeding the housing through. It's amazing how much different it makes with one cable already in that side of the bar. With some pushing and shoving, gripping and slipping, the cable showed its head at the exit of the bars. We use some long nose pliers to grip the head, gently coaxing it through like a well-trained snake charmer. Another victory for Johnny. With his refined snake charming skills, a cable tool went straight through the bars for the third cable. The same process was followed with the cable routing tool and this time the cable actually came through pretty easy. This again shows how much difference it makes when there is already another cable going through that side of the bar. And just like that, all three cables are installed. This is amazing. Now it's time to install the stem, which you'd think would be a quick slip on situation, right? No, more like a bash the round peg into the square hole kind of situation. You see, we have to pull the cables through the bars as the stem is pressed down. If you've made a mistake with the cable orientation, this is the heart stopping moment you will notice and quite possibly throw all of your toys out of the pram in frustration. Everything was looking good for us though, so the bars were pressed down while the cables were pulled through. Honestly, it's not as simple as it looks. With everything installed, we give the bars a little wiggle and they pass the test with flying colors. No tight spots to be found. They're a little bit springy, but overall, they are good to go. Did you have fun with the routine, Johnny? It wasn't the worst, but it's not easy either, so it is still a bit tight as you get, you know, add more cables in, it gets tighter. If you have one, it's not so bad. Once you start putting two through the hole, that's when it gets a bit tight. Anyway, we're getting on really is a two-man job. You have someone pulling the cables as you're kind of pulling it from underneath into the actual stem and handlebar, and then eventually you've got to push it on, and then someone's got to pull. Yeah. You just can't do it on your own, it's very difficult. Now the shifters we have are from the Sensar SRX group set that I purchased from AliExpress, which is their 1x11 group set. This group set cost £300 and that included everything apart from the brake calipers. So the Senex GR3 crank set was included in that price. I'm going to be doing a separate video in the future for all these components, so do subscribe if you don't want to miss those videos. Back to the shifters and we are starting on the right shifter, which has the front brake and the rear gear to install. We start by loosening the clamp bolt so it slides onto the handlebar. The clamp bolt isn't the easiest to get on, which seems to be a common issue with these cheaper group sets. We worked out how much outer cable housing goes into the shifter for the rear gear and then we can cut the housing down using the cable cutters. We need the rear derailleur to be installed so that we can see how much cable housing is needed at the rear of the bike at the derailleur. So we have to install it and it's actually refreshingly straightforward. First we grease the threads because it's metal on metal action, then it's simply screwed into the derailleur hanger, easy. What do you think of the uh, sensor rear derailleur then Johnny? Yes, yeah, so, um, it's pretty decent, it looks like a, like a SRAM and micro shift design mech. I think it's quite decent, it's got decent spring tension there, stiff for like gravel mountain bike use. I'm expecting great things, one can only hope. With components like this I wonder what the bike will weigh, which we will find out later in the video. We can then put the housing into the derailleur and see how much housing is required. We don't want the cable to be pushing the derailleur down or pulling it upwards. We also check the bottom bracket at this point to see how much slack we have with the cable. With the asymmetrical frame, we check whether to go over or under the bottom bracket as the right chainstay is super low where the gear cable will travel. Johnny decided that over the bottom bracket 
it was the best option. With it all measured, we can cut it down to size. An end cap is installed on the gear housing and installed into the rear derailleur. We can then push the inner cable through and watch it peek out like a little meerkat on high alert. The cable routing on the rear derailleur for the inner cable directs the cable inwards and then outwards. Unique, but it works. We can pull any slack through, tighten the clamping bolt, and she is ready for her fine adjustment, which will be coming up shortly. With the single gear cable out the way, we can focus on the brake cable. When installing the brake cables, we need the calipers to be installed so we can see how much length is required at the caliper end. I purchased these Duintec F1 Hydro Mechanical Brakes from eBay for £95 without any rotors. We installed the bolts with some additional washers because the, uh, the bolts may have been on the uh, long side still. Now we can test fit the outer into the caliper we check if an end cap could fit, it couldn't, we proceeded without and cut the housing to length and installed it in the caliper. We then checked at the shifter and no end cap was needed there either. So we measured the amount of housing that is needed to enter the shifter. With both ends installed, we can slide the inner brake cable through and watch it slide out of the front caliper. Slack is pulled through and the clamp bolt is tightened. The right shifter is complete, so over to the left shifter we go. The clamp bolt is loosened and it slid onto the handlebar without a fight. It was another treasure hunt to find bolts for the rear caliper. Now these are longer as they go through the whole frame from the underside. The caliper was tightened into the frame. The outer cable was pushed into the caliper, measured and cut down to size. At the shifter, the outer was measured, cut to size and installed. Finally, the inner cable can be pushed through and secured with the clamping bolt. Well, that's wonderful. Now let's tackle the bottom bracket. It's a bit of an overwhelming minefield, but fear not, Johnny, the uh, melodic mechanic is here to save the day. Turns out I had the wrong bottom bracket, a press fit PF30 that must have come in another package or I selected the wrong option when buying the group set. Luckily, I had another bottom bracket laying around that is the correct size, a BB86. Panic over. Although this bottom bracket is a press fit style, this bottom bracket does have a thread in the middle. So one side screws into the other. Now I've not installed one like this before, but Johnny explained the plan. With this bottom bracket we've got here, we're gonna to have to press one side in, purely because it is quite tight. Um, it's quite similar to what you have to do on the practice adapter bottom brackets, where you have to press the non-drive in, and then you basically torque it up until it stops basically. The drive side or the right hand side of the bottom bracket is the side that receives the thread. So first on the list is to press this into the frame. This is done using a lifeline bottom bracket press that costs around 50 pounds. The threaded bar is inserted through the frame. The correct adapter is placed on the non-drive side. The bearing is placed onto the drive side followed by the correct adapter. Then it is pressed in by spinning the albatross wings which pushes the bearing in. You want the bearing to go in nice and straight. I reiterate, nice and straight. If it's slightly wonky, bash it out and start again. Tighten it enough so that the lip of the bearings are nice and flush with the frame. Now the non-drive side can be screwed into the drive side that we have just inserted. You should be able to get this started by hand as long as your bottom bracket holes are aligned. Ours were. Let's say we get lucky, I mean incredibly lucky. Once you have played Thumb War with the bottom bracket and screwed it in as much as you can, it's time to reach for the Holotech 2 bottom bracket tool. I had this tool laying around, but you can buy a half decent one for around £10. This tool aligns with the little grooves on the bottom bracket lip, allowing you to get some leverage and start screwing it in. Two things to note here. The lip on this bottom bracket was pretty small, so it was hard to rotate the tool without it actually hitting the frame. You can see that here clearly in these shots. Secondly, this tool isn't the best. You can get socket style tools or tools that have a complete circle, which give you a better grip. Having said that, Johnny made good use of what we had to hand and the bottom bracket was screwed in nice and tight with no space between the lips and the frame. Although it looks quick in this video, it is a process that called for time and patience, like a skilled watchmaker meticulously assembling a timepiece rather than force and anger reminiscent of a frustrated mechanic, aka me when Johnny's not here. Give me the hammer. To neaten things up on the frame, we removed the front mech hanger by removing the two bolts. The bolts were then greased and screwed back into their home leaving a nice clean finish. To keep our gravel bike moving like a well-oiled machine, we need a way to transfer power from the bod 
to the bike and that's where the crankset comes in. Now I've chosen the Senex GR3 for this mission, a reliable and budget friendly option which was included in the cost of the complete group set. You can buy it separately low, I think it's around 70, 80 pounds. The first thing we need to do is attach a single 42 tooth chainring to the drive side crank arm. This is done with these three little bolts. These bolts are greased as it's a common place for squeaking. They're started off by hand and finally tightened with a torque wrench to seven Newton meters. More grease is applied to the bearings in the bottom brackets and on the spindle of the crank arm. I should have named this video, the modern mechanic gracefully greases carbon bike parts. Not sure if that would get more or less views. Hmm, probably more. Ah, oh, I'd love to see that. The spindle is then pushed through the bottom bracket and the non-drive side crank arm can be placed onto the end of the spindle. There is this little preload screw that is screwed into the non-drive side crank arm. This is tightened to take out any play of the crank set. You don't want this to be super tight, just enough to take out any play. There is a little tool that comes with the crank set specifically for this job. Now we can tighten the non-drive side crank arm bolts to 14 Newton meters. Each bolt is gradually tightened so it's nice equal tension. I must admit this crank set spun delightfully. With a flick of the wrist, you can see the crank arm spin with little resistance at all. That is what we like to see. At the start of the video, we set up the tubeless wheels and it's been a few hours now since Johnny completed that. And it's time to check and see if they have held pressure. Yeah, they're holding pressure pretty well. So I shouldn't have any issues of uh, these losing air anytime soon. Just do them first. At least you can figure out whether you've got an issue whether it's a tire or tape issue, then you just have to redo it. Or you just probably just need to just pump it up and just spin it around a bit just to help it seal. With the wheels in hand, we can install the disc brake rotors. For this build, I've gone with these Prime rotors from Wiggle. I've not tried them before, but thought I'd give them a whirl. They are 25 pound each, so we can add that to the tally. It's worth noting that they don't come with locking nuts though, which is a little annoying. These need to be purchased separately, which I was unaware of, and they cost four pound each, so another eight pound. No idea why they don't come together. A little grease was applied onto the spline. This can then be placed onto the rotor where it will see out its graceful life. Grease then went on the lock ring and it's time to get the thing tight. To do this, we actually use a cassette tool with a torque wrench. Now I have this absolute unit of a torque wrench that can tighten up to 250 Newton meters. My dad actually gave this torque wrench to me or in other words, I stole it from him at the first opportunity. Borrowed. I think you can pick them up for around 50 pounds. Johnny's bicep and a bit of leverage work together in unison to tighten the lock nut up to a solid 40 Newton meters. And as if by magic, we can simply repeat the same process on the other wheel, like some sort of bicycle assembly deja vu. For this build, I've gone for 1146 tooth cassette, and this one is made by Sensor and came with the group set. This cassette in combination with the 42 tooth chainring should give me a decent range of gears. Let's see if I'm saying that up the first big hill. I hadn't realized that with this cassette on 11 speed free hub, I would actually need a spacer on the free hub first. So it was back to hunting for spare parts, which is becoming a little too common in this build. Luckily I had a spacer that came in my turbo trainer. So that went straight on the greased free hub before the cassette. Then we can place all the cogs from the cassette onto the free hub. They can only go on one way. I found the easiest option is to align the smallest groove on the free hub and the smallest groove on the cassette. We can then grab the torque wrench again with the cassette tool and tighten it to 40 newton meters the same as the disc brake locking nuts with all the grease flying around like an overly enthusiastic chef whatever takes your fancy it's time to bring out the disc brake cleaner a few sprays and wipes and we evict any unwanted residue grease and oil from the precious rotors the wheels are all set up and ready to be received by the bike as these calipers are used johnny used a plastic tire lever to push the pistons back opening the pads up. This is because they could have been pushed further out than required and too narrow to allow our disc, our new disc, to slide in. The through axle was greased in prep and the wheel slid in place nicely. The through axle was tightened to secure the wheel in place. The caliper mounting bolts are then loosened so that we can adjust the caliper to ensure it's in line with the rotor. This is done by pressing the brake lever which forces the pads to grip the rotor. We spin the wheel and repeat this process. When the caliper is centralized to the disc, which it should be, we can tighten the caliper mounting bolts back up. 
The lock nut for the cable is loosened and any slack in the cable is pulled through. The bolt can then be tightened back up, gripping the inner cable. A few pulls on the brake shows that this is working well with a good amount of lever pull. Time for the rear wheel and we follow the same process. The pistons are pushed back with a plastic tire lever. It's important to use something plastic. Don't grab that beefy screwdriver. I know you want to. Tempting. The through axle is greased, the wheel is installed and secured with the through axle. The caliper bolts are loosened, the wheel is then spun and the brake applied to centralise the caliper. The bolts can then be tightened back up to secure the caliper in place. We can then loosen the cable clamping bolt, pull the slack through and tighten the clamping bolt back up. A lovely jubbly. Finish everything nicely, the inner cables are cut down to size and the little end cap is crimped in place. Before setting up the drive chain, we are going to install the pedals. It's all about making your life easier. No Flintstone technology around here. Johnny used the Allen key to tighten it up, it's easier and quicker and you can get a good grip. With the right pedal installed, over to the left we go and follow the same process. Remember, the left pedal has a reverse thread, so be careful when installing. You don't want to cross thread the bolt and ruin your crank arm. For the chain, we have this unbranded chain that came with the group set. Hopefully it doesn't go ping with the first delivery of power. When finding the correct chain length, Johnny placed it onto the smallest cog at the rear, through the derailleur, and then around the single chain ring at the front. Using the smallest cog at the rear gives you more slack in the chain, which makes it easier to check the length. As it turns out, this chain was actually the perfect length out of the box, which is great, but is also one link away from being not so great. If I had a bigger chain ring or cassette range, it would have been game over. With the chain in place, Johnny installed the split link that was provided with the chain, a very simple job overall. So adjusting the gears, um, first thing you can do is, the cable's ready on, I've really kind of tensioned it enough, so it was not too bad, but I still had to use a bad adjust to fine tune it, just so I can go through the cassette, but it wasn't dropping into the highest gear, so what I had to do was loosen the high screw, which is the screw that says H, right next to it here, get it enough so it will drop in, and then once it drops in and it's not making much noise, then I can go through the rest of the gears and fine tune it. Then when I was now going up to the lower end, it wasn't going into three or two and even one because the lower screw was screwed in a bit too much. So I had to undo that one as well so I can get it all the way up there. Now, once I've got those gears and they were working, then I had to adjust the B tension screw, which is here, which was just the distance between the upper jockey wheel and the cassette. And what I have to do there I tend to find it works with most mountain bike gears with a big cassette is get a three mil gap between the gear one, which is the biggest um, sprocket on the cassette and the upper jockey wheel. And then once I've got that gap, the gears generally work perfectly. The rear derailleur cable is then cut down to size and the end cap is installed to give everything that nice neat finish that we like to see. Now we can align the front wheel with the bars. So the stem bolts are loosened, the wheel is aligned with the bars and the stem bolts can be tightened back up to six newton meters. It's like giving your bike a little chiropractic adjustment. Next we need to decide on the position of the shifters. Do I want them angled in or do I want them in a straight line with the bike? As these bars have a little flare, I decided to go with the shifters at an angle. Johnny did make a point as well that with the shifters at an angle, when you are on the drops, you can still reach the levers because they are in line on the same angle as your hands. So we gave them a little wiggle and made sure they were both in the same position. Then onto the fun job of trying to tighten the bolts on the shifters to clamp them to the bars, which honestly is a real pain. There is certainly no way that my torque wrench is gonna get on there. So Johnny used his years of judgment to tighten the clamping bolt to around six newton meters. He used a little trick with a spanner over an allen key to get some leverage and tighten them up. We then offered up the spirit level to check the shifters were actually the same height, making sure that the bike was level as well and it was looking pretty much spot on. Next on the list of the uh, modest mechanic, the alliteration just keeps coming, was the seat post. We loosened the seat clamping bolt and adjusted the seat height before torquing the bolt back to six newton meters roughly. With the bike on the floor, we then noticed that the saddle was pointing upwards. So out came the 10 mil spanner and the Allen key to adjust the bolts that keep the seat in place. With a wrench here and a twist there, the saddle was roughly level. Bar tape has got to be my least favorite part of building a bike, so I'm intrigued to watch Johnny fit this tape. Now we have this prime comfort bar tape that I'm a big fan of and I've used on many of my previous builds. It costs 20 pounds and comes in different versions for different bike types. Starting on the right hand side, three rotations of the tape were installed, leaving enough overhang for the end cap to grip. 
The end cap was then installed and tightened up with an Allen key. Simple, but very effective. From there, Johnny wrapped clockwise around the right shifter, which is the same way your hand will be rotating. So when riding, you will be twisting the tape tighter, not looser. The speed at which Johnny chucked this bar tape on is crazy. When someone is well rehearsed in a skill, it's actually really satisfying to watch, but also hard to catch on camera because I'm just trying to keep up. When we got to the shifter, Johnny adopted a figure of eight technique. However, we noticed that the shifter cable was sticking up slightly. So to try and minimize the impact of that cable, we applied some electrical tape in order to hold it down as best we can. The figure of eight was then completed, ensuring it's nice and tight to further help keep the cable down. Johnny then made his way up the bars, ensuring that each wrap had the same gap so that it was consistent. Pro tip number two, wrap the bars a little bit further than you need, then mark them where you want to make the cut with the scissors that way you are not making the cut blind with the tape removed from the bars this also allows you to choose where the end of the bar tape will finish preferably on the underside out of the way the scissors can then be used to give the bar tape the snip we then secured the end of the tape by wrapping three rotations of electrical tape around the end. We opted to go for the electrical tape finish because it is gloss which matches the bars. The finishing kit was matte which didn't look as good. While Johnny was busy repeating the same steps on the left hand side of the bars, I was busy trying to get some visually pleasing footage so that your eyes are as satisfied as your brain watching this video. One thing that Johnny done on the left side is ensure that there was the same amount of rotations as the right side on the tops. I'm not kidding, it was literally like eeny meeny miny mo, counting one side and then replicating it on the left side. This level of detail is wonderful and makes my brain and eyes very happy indeed. Very private emotions. We use tools that have a total value of £320 or $400. If you don't have these tools already, then this is an additional cost on top of all the components. Onto the components, and if we reveal the cost of the frame set, custom paint and shipping for the wheels and the frame, we have a grand total of £1,708 or $2,138. As you can see, she weighs in at around 8.8 .8 kilograms. I'm happy with that for a gravel bike that has big fat tires that looks as good as she does. Um, yeah, just building this bike up. It wasn't too bad to build, it's quite easy. Um, it looks great, as you can see the color scheme. That's the Martin Green. And yeah, the bars, I'm, I'm quite actually surprised how well the bars look and how they feel as well. We've just done a quick test ride on it. And the position we, I put on the shifters and the flare on the bars, perfect. Group set, I mean, you can just look at it. It's, uh, it's It shifts well, looks great. Um, can't really fault it at the moment, so the proof will be in the pudding. Now, do check out this video next where I build a £2,000 carbon fibre superbike using cheap Chinese carbon frame from the ground up, similar to this build. Thanks for watching. If you made it this far, you're a legend. I'll see you in the next one.